Hello. This is Critical Thinking, another episode of Thinking About Stuff. It's November 7, 2019. This episode is entitled Sensitivity to Life. There's um, some things that I need to say in response to recent events. They're not as meaningful as anything. So, but it's a way of framing our understanding of uh, who we are as humans and how we work, how it works as a human, right? Uh, I can speak best to this as a male. I don't have all, I mean, I've got feminine characteristics, you know, all of that kind of thing, right? Just, we're all blend. But um, uh, I don't know the experience of being female, so I can't really um, discuss it at a level that uh, it would be especially meaningful. But as, a, but as a male, I've suffered, so I understand what's going on. So anyway, here's the, here's the concept. And I'll try to make sure I keep the sound adequate here. So this line here, this horizontal line, that separates death and life. There's life up here, there's whatever we call death down here, also known as the metempsychoses. And that basically means thought after death, whatever mentition, whatever thought occurs to consciousness, whatever that experience is. And that's down here, okay? And that's basically uh, what it's like uh, on this side of the birth and the death barrier. Okay, this is just a model, right? This is just a way to frame it in your head, okay? You're a young man or an old man, and um, this is just a way to understand uh, what our thinking is and how it can be affected and where that can lead, okay? And so let's talk about it as an old man, all right? Because as an old man, I've also been a young man, so I've experienced both. And uh, there are commonalities here. Um, they're complementary. They're not identical. They're not polarized. They complement each other. So it is my understanding that all young men should, in the course of some one of their lives, experience both aspects of this particular sensitivity to life issue. And so um, we'll discuss it in, in that fashion, right? And so um, you're born, some time passes, eight months, 18 months, and you enter into the body that's been prepared for you. Consciousness springs to life in the material, in life. And consciousness is surrounded by matter. <coughs> now consciousness, has no particles, it's entirely energy. And so this is the most amazing thing uh, totally to think about, is that as consciousness, there's no matter at all, there's no sensation, there's no nothing. Yet when we're in the materium, we do have sensation, okay? And this sensation can drive you crazy, will drive you crazy at some point in your life. The issue is for how long? Most people will encounter this. And the issue has to do with the fact that we're energy. Consciousness is energy. The materium, where we think we have matter, is nothing more than energy smacking into itself to, in order to create the sensation that flows back to our consciousness to trick us to think that this illusion is somehow solid. Okay? So in that sense, it's like living in a hologram. This is not a hologram. Holograms are a cheap imitation. Um, you know, don't be fooled by a cheap imitation, guys. Go for the real thing. Go for life. And so, like, this is life up here. And this would be non-life. 
And there's all of this done in here is speculation because we're not there now. So we can't meaningfully discuss it. I think I can at some levels, but I'm not going to go there today. And here's, here's why. Life is the important bit. If we think of things in terms of linear, of time, then this is, let's, let's assume that over here you are born. And this is the beginning of your life. And your life progresses. It's not linear. It's all involved in a cycle. The Hindus call it the cycle of rebirth. The Buddhists call it the, the wheel of rebirth. And, and it's a big cycle thing. You go around and around and around. So over here you're born. Well, this entire span here until you die is indeterminate. But it's a very finite indeterminacy. Okay? So this entire expanse from this point here of your birth to this point here of your death, that wedge might be zero years. You know, you might be born and then they drop the bomb on Hiroshima and that's it for you. Right? Uh, or, let's just be generous. Let's just say you take a lot of C60, you take care of yourself, you got all kinds of bags of money, you know, you do everything that science can possibly do, so maybe you'll get, you know, maybe you'll be, in our current era, you might be like uh, George Soros or, or, you know, one of these elitists. You might get to 90 or so, and have, but, but a lot of them are losing their minds and all of that. But, but let's just assume that, that you had a perfectly uh, sound body and were able to think your way out of problems for a great deal of time, and you achieved what, what no men in our current situation have, and you lived an extraordinarily long life. Let's just peg that as, say, 250 years. So this, this 250 years to zero years, that represents the span of your life. Well, that span is represented by this arc here within the, uh, this hemis uh, uh, hemicircular half of a circle. So this arc right there represents the span of your life, divided up into however many years you're going to live. But here's the real kicker on this. If you live a very robust life and you expend lots of your energy and you get lots of key back and you work it and you shove it back out there and, and you're affecting millions of people and all of that kind of stuff, something weird happens. Or not weird, I mean, it's, it's sort of understandable. So let's go, go here and we'll draw ourselves another little, little object. And this, this is a more representational, at a temporal level, of what life and the metempsychoses are, is actually like, okay? And so we're going to transform this thing here to a representation of, of a real strong life, lived 100 years, of impacting millions, you know, uh, maybe even at the order of like a Hitler, but it doesn't have to be that way. It could be, you know, any kind of an entertainer, a great scientist, any of this kind of shit, a banker, a great criminal. All of these individuals share the, this commonality, and that is that they pack a lot of energy activity within to that however long their life is. And so we'll call that a long life, and we'll put that up here. And so you see that I've reduced it so that we can get into a sense of scale here, right? And let's reduce it even further because we have to get seriously into scale. And that, so we're going to say that an entire long life that might be 80 years, 100 years, we're going to compress that into this little tiny bit. But on the metempsychosis side of that individual life, because you've shed such huge amounts of energy, because you've affected so many people, you might find that your heaven and hell visit and your long rest is going to be, the great sleep, is going to be disproportionately, temporally extended. So if this was 100 years of hard-hitting life, you know, a Dan Pena, somebody like that, right? Uh, Joe Rogan, somebody like that. May Joe Rogan exceed 100 years of hard-hitting life. May he, he stomp on this planet for a hundred years, leaving the footprints of his thinking all around. And I can assure you that his metempsychoses will be like this. It will be disproportionately large compared to the extent of that period here in the materium. And this part of the, of the, the disproportionately large is to burn out, to clean off all of the karma that accumulates during that hard-hitting 100-year life. 
because every action is, in fact, a karmic call, a draw, a magnetism. We live in a dielectric universe, which I'll go into at some other point. Uh, so, so this represents a, an excellent life. And that, that span here might actually be 3,000 years that you'll be involved in the metempsychosis. 3,000 of Earth years, of temporal reality years that you'll be involved in the metempsychosis. And that's the cycle that we operate under. So, the, the, the correlate, the, the reverse of this is also true, okay? That a life that is lived very briefly with very little impact requires very little time in the metempsychosis. Not necessarily a good thing because recycling quickly does not advance you the way that recycling slowly does. The idea is progress. Let's just say that the idea is progress and we'll just put that as an upward arrow. The idea is to progress ourselves as individuals and to extract from universe everything that is there that we can get hold of as an individual and take into ourselves. As a male, we feel this in our blood. You feel it pounding in you. You feel that desire to, to get hold of this stuff, to consume it, to master it, to own it, okay? That is our goal here on life. Now, if you recycle quickly, eh, you know, there may, there's reasons for that, karmic reasons, certainly. But there's also reasons to try and extend it as much as possible once you kick into this idea, right? And so, so some lives are going to be small and have little impact, and they'll have a very relatively little impact on their, on their temporality. Other lives are going to be small in duration but have huge amounts of energy, like Joe Rogan is going to be long and 100 years plus, and, and he's going to have a huge level of impact on us and a giant level of metempsychosis activity. That's just the way that all of this works. Now, here's the thing. When you're in here in Earth, when you're here in the materium, all kinds of shit can affect you because you are bound by the matter, the illusion of reality uh, that is solid. Okay, because this is so, your thinking, your consciousness can be not your conscious, your consciousness cannot be changed, but your thinking, which is the manifestation of your consciousness here within the materium, can be altered and it can be trapped, and it can be distorted, can be taken over, um, uh, you know, you can be hypnotized, you can be mesmerized, you can be beguiled, bewittled, um, uh, befuddled, puzzled, um, all these things, all these kinds of, of descriptors, if we think about them, all of these emotional words are all reflective of our frequency, our emotional frequency at any given time, right? Because you know what it's like to feel puzzled, like, mm, what the fuck, you know? There's a particular feeling for that. Or, oh my God, the clarity of that, you know? Whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, as a, as a male, you're uh, heterosexually inclined, whatever, and, uh, and for the first time you see naked boobs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a gigantic slap in the face and, a, and, a, and it has a particular feeling, that sense of, of uh, discovery, that sense of this moment. And so, so we have a, a, a vibrational intensity in each and every moment in our lives. Now this is most true here in the Materium. This is where we're discussing it. And so we have this this vibrational emotional intensity that goes with us throughout our entire lives okay now what we've done here is we've got our birth line as this black line that goes uh, in the and is split in half we have down up here we have a blue line which goes and leads up to these words ecstasy and agony and and this blue line represents very intense emotionality okay and ecstasy and agony are two halves of the same coin. It is your nerves and your desire, everything, your, your consciousness, your body, mind, all vibrating at such a high frequency that you get this, um, this um, emotional impact that we have labeled ecstasy. If, it, if you think of it as, a, as an overwhelming positive. Or agony, if you think of it as overwhelming suffering because it's pain longer you live, the greater the chance you'll, ex you'll have to encounter both of these. So, 
Old men, no agony. Uh, old men, many of them, no ecstasy as well. And I'm not talking the, the crappy synthetic psychologic, or psychedelic drug. I'm talking about the emotional, uh, the emotion of ecstasy. And see, the problem with being human is we try and trap ourselves. Ecstasy is so fucking fantastic, we think we want to live there all the time. Nope, we don't really. Uh, just as you don't want to live in agony all the time, you certainly don't want to live in ecstasy all the time. Brief visits on both occasions are best. All right, now here's the thing about um, these two lines, the red and the blue line. They represent the range of what it is to be human in terms of what we feel that transmits to our consciousness, that we take into our bodies, and that we take into our metempsychoses. Uh, to absorb and deal with in our, in our death phase, okay, on the other side of the death barrier. And um, the, this range is where we think that, that we have some control, all right? We think that within that range, it's up to us to decide how we're going to react to these things. And it's sort of true, but it's not. It's up to us to decide how we're going to react to them, but we can't not experience them, okay? So if you're in agony, you can't turn off a switch and say, no, nah, I'll deal with it later. I don't want to have agony at the moment. Okay, or ecstasy. You can't turn off a switch and say, uh, oh my God, I'm uh, you know, stunned by the, the sunset and uh, you know, uh, whatever the hell. But nope, nope, turn off a switch, can't do it now. It doesn't work that way, okay? So within our potential span of life, our zero years to 250 years, we have this uh, potential for, we, we have a, a solid certainty of living constantly, moment by moment by moment, bound within this range of what it is to be human. This range of what it is to be human is our emotional response, right? And it goes between these two ranges. And it could be within there, anywhere within this, this space as we go forward through our lives. It changes moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. That's the, the agony of being human and that is the ecstasy of being human the fact that everything changes it is certain things change you live in the materium the only thing you can count on is change because that is the nature of our universe there is nothing in our universe that is static there's nothing in our universe that is um, uh, even held in a suspension for more than the time it takes to measure that time in other words, the instant we're aware that we're in ecstasy and we, and we start focusing on the, how long the ecstasy is, is lasting, we've lost it. We're coming out of it. Um, the, the reverse, to a certain extent, is true. The instant that we start thinking we're in agony, that's when we begin being in agony, okay, once we recognize it. Emotions are strange critters, right? Or they're, they're the point, the way we learn on this, in this materium. They submit every one of our memories to our karma and so that we can take these things with us into the future, into other lives. But in some many, many, many moments of living through these emotions, we don't want to be there because it's so fucking painful. This is especially true as uh, young men, okay? And that's because uh, of two things. So as time passes, so let's just say that time flows let me get another color here just uh, okay so so let's say that time flows this way just just for the sense of, of thinking about things right so as time passes we accumulate all right we're a condensate there is a condensate that I'm living in here and as as time passes I do things like I consume sugar I may drink alcohol. I may drink coffee. Many of you have seen me do it. Uh, tea, caffeinated drinks, etc. Right? Um, uh, I might eat, uh, or, or my diet affects this, these things. Okay? And basically, what I'm talking about here is the accumulation of matter, of actual material, that affects the corporeality that we live within to, the, to the, the extent that it alters our experience of this range of potential emotions that we're going to have going forward. So let me give you an example. Okay, so 
And this is all going to sensitivity to life. All right. So these things accumulate over time. Uh, and, you know, this includes sex, uh, especially religion. Religion will do this like nothing else. Um, uh, drugs, uh, some kinds of drugs. OK, so we'll just put a, a star in there. I'm talking about the opiates, the those kind of drugs that are body stones primarily, all right, that accumulate, they accumulate in the body. Even heavy, heavy, heavy indica marijuana falls in this category if you consume nothing but that. So all of these kind of things, let's call them dulling agents or accumulation agents. They clog your, your sensitivity to life and they lower your ability to feel that range. Well, this is also true of vast quantities of emotions okay if you're living in agony for most of your life as, as an adult you will find that you become desensitized to life because your your vibration of your nerves and your and your blood is so trapped in the agony part that it can feel nothing else and and you can't live there so you naturally desensitize it any fucking way you can this is why paranoid schizophrenics smoke because the tobacco i should put that down for two tobacco uh, it, it's a drug, but, but specifically a lot of people use it in, independent uh, of, its, uh, of the nicotine. They use it for the other chemicals that come on in and actually uh, pollute their system, but that dulls it so you don't have to suffer that agony all the time. Okay, so bear in mind, humans want to have ecstasy all the time. Uh, now think about it. You can't orgasm all the time. Most of sex is not the orgasm. Most of it is the prelude and the afterlude, right, to the orgasm. So the 99% of it is not orgasm. But yet, look, we think we want to live there all the time. But we know for fucking sure we don't want to live in pain all the time. Agony is terrible. I've done it for years. It's part of that cancer thing. I can assure you that I know what the fuck I'm talking about. You don't want to live in agony. It has its benefits to your karma. It has its benefits to your character, but you don't want to live there. And we all know this because we feel it and it hurts. We want to get away from it. We want to take drugs, kill the pain, etc. right? Many people want to dull the pain of life. And it's not pain of life, really. It's this exquisite sensitivity to life. Now, as you get old, as you become an old man, so let's just say that this half here is, is young and this half here is older, okay? As you progress here, as you get down into the older area of life, you will find that this material here, that material there, all the stuff you've been consuming, all those women you've had, all, those, all the drugs, all the gambling parties, all the late nights, all those cross-country flights, all the radiation, everything is dulling you out as an old man. You get grumpy, you get creaky, things hurt all the time. Not, not enough to be agony, but not, there's no ecstasy, there's no happiness, there's no sensitivity. And that's because what happens is this vibrational level. As a young man, when you, you start off in life, you try and spend, most of, most of our lives are spent hovering in this little range here, right? As we go forward, we, we vibrate our way around our life. Sometimes you get spikes out to the ecstasy. And you know, that, that spikes out to the ecstasy thing is just fucking incredible. And it drives you forward like you wouldn't, you cannot conceive until you've had that. And you, you say, I've got to have that feeling again. I've got to go there again. And then sometimes you get a bad trip. You get pain, you know. Here, let's do this in red just for that purpose. And so as you come down into here, you get these spikes into the agony part. And this really, this isn't the agony aspect totally because this is where it becomes dull. So as every time you become um, stressed, every time your body pumps out cortisol instead of estrogen, testosterone, every time you, uh, you have massive pain, the scars are left, karma accumulates, your body clogs up, okay? So you lose sensitivity as these agony episodes happen. Now, so you're actually gonna have, uh, and this is stupid to get into the details, but you'll have an agony episode that'll take you out to the same level. But what it does is it leaves this residual debris that helps to dull you, okay? So agony and ecstasy are on this blue line, and the dullness down here is on the red line. The dullness accumulates over time. 
such that by the time you've had lots of this shit over your life and you get up to say middle age, you suddenly see that you're vibrating more down in here and less up on your on your actual birth line, right? You're starting to get down into here where you're dull most often. And the progression would have you vibrate all the way down into dullness and then death. Okay, leaving the sensitivity to life behind. Okay, so... This is why old men take psychedelics. This is why psychedelic drugs have been prescribed by shaman uh, especially to the elite, especially to rulers and, um, you know, the chief of the village and all of this kind of thing, especially to these individuals where sharp mind, flexible nature, because over time, as you accumulate more of the crap in your system, your thinking becomes rigid. It becomes, um, calcified. You may still be intelligent, but you don't have a flexibility of intelligence. You don't have the ability to grasp a new idea easily. It becomes difficult to learn. And that has less to do with the actual clogging of the brain, although that actually uh, manifests within your brain. And that's more of a s symptom to the energetic thing that's going on to you, which is this lack of sensitivity to life because you've accumulated life, basically. All right. And that's what all of this shit here, everything you've done, you've accumulated the impacts of life on your body, on your, on your um, feeling mind, your body mind and your desire mind. Okay. It's those three minds that we live in constantly, all intertwined. So now, the Stoic, um, the Stoic, the Yogi, um, the Taoist, okay? But not such people as um, the ecstatics, okay? So not people like the uh, whirling dancers who are trying to constantly stay in, a, in the same state. Those are individuals that, like the whirling dancers, the cultists, um, all of these kind of, of individuals are all trying to maintain, they're basically trying to game the system such that they never experience any of the agony part, and they, they think they can trick their body into staying always into ecstasy, shading towards that. It's a, a crude description of it, but that's basically what's going on there. So the, the Taoists, the Yogi, and the Stoics all understood something, and that was that you're better off in the long haul trying to even things out, appreciating the agony and appreciating the ecstasy as it is presented, but doing so without attachment to those states. Because it's not those states that cause the problem, it's the attachment to them. The inability to think about your relationship, your emotional feeling towards these states within your own body and mind. And so the Stoics, the Yogi, the Taoists say, I'm going to suffer in my life. I'm going to have great pain and then I'm going to die. There's not a fuck all I can do about it. So I need to think about that ahead of time and to prepare my mind and my body and my, my key, my karma, or my, my prana, my, my central vibration core for that eventuality. And when I get there, then I can experience it, know what it is like, but not be lost to the experience, okay? And so that's really the goal of Stoicism, the yogic activities. Many There's divergent things in yoga, so there's some that are ecstatics and some that are into depriving themselves and warping their bodies and all different kinds of things, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those individuals that think, okay? Not those that are just simply out there accumulating fucking karma because they're not thinking and they're just trapped up into the activity of it all, right? Better to stop and analyze than act. Because you're going to get karma either way. All right, so here, here we have our sensitivity to life issue. As you go through life, you're going to find that you're, you've had so much stuff happen to you that by the time you get back into here, the ability to feel things at a pristine level becomes lost because of this accumulation. And this is why curanderos and shaman um, from the Polynesian Islands to Australia to New Zealand to uh, the depths of Cambodia to uh, South America to Mesoamerica to the indigenous people here in, in North America. This is why shaman everywhere love psychedelics, okay? Because psychedelics 
can be microdosed. Psychedelics have to be microdosed. I think it's like um, 25 micrograms or something that is the effective dose of LSD. Now, I don't like LSD as a, as a psychedelic. I mean, it's okay. It, it has some uses as, as a psychiatric tool, but it, it lacks so many of the other um, moderating chemicals that it doesn't do what other things do. So you can microdose with LSD for creativity, but that's all it's going to do for you is, is maybe boost creativity if you're lucky. Maybe. Okay. Um, the curanderos and the, and the shaman, um, these guys would prescribe... Uh, for their uh, patients in the village or whatever that are suffering from this accumulation from a desensitization to life, they'll prescribe psychedelics in small little amounts on a regulated, ba regulated basis over a small time frame. And it'll be done watching these the people as they go through it. And uh, so we're talking about a little tiny, tiny bit of magic mushroom, a little tiny bit of um, uh, San Pedro cactus tea, this kind of thing, right? Um, uh, and that cl clears the clogs. <laughs> it truly does. It, it comes on in for old men and it removes this, this, this feeling of being bound, this, this clogged feeling that's this accumulation here. And it may, as an, as you encounter these substances and you come into this, this, uh, if you're in a, you know, the village issue, they, okay. So, so if you're living in a village environment with, um, with a shaman, then likely you'll be dealing with them every day. So it's not like it's a, you know, visit a doctor, get your drugs, go home, take them, that kind of thing. It doesn't work that way. So microdosing for old people can be hugely effective because it can increase your sensitivity to life. But you got to know what the hell you're doing, right? You can't be gobbling uh, magic mushrooms and expect that you're going to be fine and clear and so on. You got to understand it takes day. If you take enough to be seriously affected, it can take days to uh, reintegrate your personality. Uh, it matters what time of day it you take it. The set and setting matter, even at a micro dose, okay? Even at a level that does not necessarily impact your ability to get up, make breakfast, have coffee, that sort of thing. Uh, but you take enough to, uh, any, any of it will impact the sensitivity to life issues. So there will be residual effects. So there's sometimes the shaman will have... Um, uh, uh, old people take micro doses before they go to bed in a particular kind of a, a liquid form, right? For specific kinds of responses. There's other times where you want to, you know, you, you want to take your little tiny bit of magic mushroom as a powder on your, your morning coffee or something, these kind of things. And, um, but they're done specifically for the sensitivity of life issue. Okay, so, so here we're talking about old men and how psychedelics can come on in and remove this layer, this binding layer of debris, so to speak, of experienced debris, that experienced debris that clogs your system and, and removes the sensitivity to life and makes you old and grumpy and pissy, right? Now, you, you take psychedelic, it's not going to help arthritis. It, it will at some level, but... The, the psychedelics cause uh, nootropic. They cause new brain cells to be created, new neural pathways to be created. They make you think about things differently. And in, in, in this period of time in your life here, you may be bound up in a particular way of thinking where you think you're an alcoholic. And you so you drink, drink, drink all the time. And then you go and you take, you know, your curandero says, no, you're not doing the village any good. Come on over here and drink some of my brew. And you go, you drink some of his brew. You have one hell of a fucking night. Uh, maybe uh, the next day is weird beyond understanding, and then you go talk to him the day after, and you start coming back, and then you realize, oh, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I don't drink anymore. So uh, this is, um, uh, you know, this is basically the uh, a crude way of describing how this shit works for you. It is not like the allopathic medicines. This is something you've got to understand. I'm not advocating that anybody go on out and microdose. I'm just leading up to a particular point here relative to young men, okay? Because as an old man, I know I've suffered here. I've felt this. I'm 60, I'm going on 67. So, so I've felt this clogging of the system. So I know what that's like. Now, a lot of that had to do with my cancer and so on and so on. We'll leave that alone. But when I was a young man, I was acutely uh, paranoid schizophrenic. So I felt this incredible uh, vibrational issue that you get in that state of being. And so I understand that you can't live out here. 
I understand because my body, my mind, was warped by the process of being a paranoid schizophrenic, and it, it tried to, to force me out here continuously, and because of that essence, many, many paranoid schizophrenics kill themselves. They do so at an early age. Uh, paranoid schizophrenia uh, is can be affected by vitamins. You can you can cure it. That you can treat it. Okay, so that you don't ever have to suffer from most of it, and you can actually get at that. All right, heavy duty vitamins. Uh, go look up orthomolecular medicine and vitamin B3 and ratios and all of that relative to paranoid schizophrenia. However, paranoid schizophrenia uh, rarely strikes before the twenties, but when it does, it is brutal, incredibly brutal. It frequently strikes men in their 30s and 40s. And, and it hits you out in here and you don't have any ability to cope with it. And you don't understand what's going on and it's forcing you to try and live out in here. And even things, by the way, like trauma. Let's put this down here. You know, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Killing someone can be enough of a trauma, just one episode of it, that it'll affect the rest of your life. As it should be. And... But, but such things can force you into a state where you're always up here constantly at that level. And you can't live there. The vibrational level is just too intense. And so people kill themselves. This happens to schizophrenics, especially early onset schizophrenics, way early in their, in their puberty years, right? Uh, where they, uh, as a schizophrenic, you, you don't relate. You're, you know your mind doesn't work the same way everybody else's does you feel that you the need to ostracize or, or to isolate you're ostracized by the social order because your uh your responses to things are inappropriate that those responses are filtered by this mind and you can't get that mind under control or straight and so and and, it, and you live at a vibrational level that is just intense really fucking intense and so so here we go you know that's at that point Paranoid schizophrenics encounter it, and they go through it or they don't. And if they, they do, then they may live a reasonably long life uh, as a paranoid schizophrenic, and they'll, they'll die up here, but they'll actually die, they'll die at like this age, but it's because of mass accumulation of stuff to try and force themselves not to feel. Fundamentally, that's what it is. And so you do anything, you know, I mean, you smoke like you wouldn't believe, anything to keep from feeling. And, it, and it's not physical feeling so much, it's that emotional twang, uh, that emotional vibration. So, so as a young man, you experience the opposite of what you're going to go through as an old man, okay? So as an old man, you're going to accumulate crap in your system. Your oil's sluggish. you got to get, you know, things changed, right? As a young man, your system may be boosted too high. You may be assaulted by too many vibrations. Nowadays, we've got electromagnetic vibrations as well, Wi-Fi, all of these kind of things. None of this shit you can control. So you can't control it outside of your body, so you've got to get your body right. You've got to get your mind right in order to survive this on both ends of the life spectrum as you go through it at both ends. As a young man, you've got to deal with this level of sensitivity driving you to the point where, where you're crazy. Where you, where you act inappropriately, where you take psychotropic drugs, you know, even those prescribed by the butthead doctors, and you go off and you kill people, all right? Because your mind is so fried by these drugs and by the twang of this sensitivity to life, this vibration, this pss that constantly permeates everything. As an old man, you desperately try to feel again. You've accumulated all of that. Now, as an old man, you take little tiny bits of, of psychedelics to flush the system out, clean the pipes out. There's flowing again. Things feel good, you know. You've got some sensitivity to life. As a young man, you may get to the point where, or at any age, you know, 40, 50, that's still a very young man. You've had trauma, you know, the government, the system. It's had you out doing shit that you could not believe ever that you would do. And... The brain rebels. The mind rebels. It makes you take amphetamines, opiates, all different kinds of things to not feel. These plug you up as a young man. They bind you up in ways that you can't, can't understand. 
They prevent you from thinking your way out of your problems because you can't see yourself out of the problems because you're in the problem and you're responding to the problem, the perception of the problem, all of which is not the problem, it's how you're feeling and that you don't want to feel that way. And you can't stop yourself. And so there's only one choice or your mind says, perchance to dream, right? The slings and arrows of life, right? And so it's a valid option for some individuals under some circumstances. It has a karmic component at so many levels. And people take it. There's a way to not do that, though. And that's the point of this video. The way to not do it, in my opinion, is to take psychedelics, quality psychedelics, under the best possible conditions you can get and blow yourself right out of that frame of mind. Where psychedelics in this part of life clean out the pipes if taken in little tiny bits, sometimes it becomes necessary in this part of life to just blow it out, to just take a dose and alter everything. And this is dangerous, it's risky. Uh, you could take psychedelics at huge shamanic levels. Uh, you can climb a giant tree, think you can fly, and you're gonna die. But if you were suicidal, so it's a risk reward issue. If you're suicidal, if as a young man you're vibrating at that level that's too high, that's been running too long at that level, especially if the vibrations are internal and not uh, caused by trauma, that kind of thing, but rather by something you cannot put your finger on, you, where you can't legitimately say to yourself, it was that that did it to me that caused me to be this way. If you can't do that, you know, if, it, if you can't say, well, it was Afghanistan, okay? If, you, if it was Afghanistan, there's still point to taking psychedelics. Psychedelics purge. Um, you know, it's not nice. You die in the process, take, the process of taking the psychedelics um, personality-wise, but um, uh, they cure. It is a cure. It's not, or treatment, however you want to think about it. You know, you take it and you're different. So, if you're bound in by that super sensitivity to life at a young, young age and you can't control it, you can't get out of it, and you can't get beyond it, and you see only one outlet, I'm here to tell you there is another one. And it'll make you entirely different. And it will change things for you. Not necessarily good. Not necessarily for the better. It won't alter your karma but it will provide you with an opening to change in your thought processes, thought processes that may possibly provide you with a better approach to the rest of this journey. And that's the point of the sensitivity to life issue. If you're an old person, you may want to go find a cure in Daryl. Okay, guys, it's been a very sad time. This is um, uh, filmed here on uh, November 7th, 2019. And uh, it's a uh, Mercury retrograde. And I'm going to do a, some more videos in the future about um, uh, some stuff I've discovered relative to energies. And uh, some of it will make sense relative to this. But it's been a very sad time. And... Perhaps we can ameliorate some sadness for other people as we go forward. Bye.